the lean categories. And uh, so I want to recall what we did last time. So, so last time uh, we uh, made the following definition. So we defined symmetric tensor categories over a field K. And uh, we uh, said that a symmetric tensor category, so this will mean symmetric tensor category, Uh, okay, uh, um, C has a moderate growth if uh, for every uh, x in C there exists a number Cx greater or equal to 1 uh, such that the length of uh, x to the n is less than or equal than Cx to the n for any n greater or equal to 0. So, uh, so this means that the lengths of powers of x grow uh, not faster than exponentially. So in computer science, this is regarded uh, as a fast growth. We want polynomial growth in computer science. But in the theory of tensor categories, this is too, too good to hope for. And uh, the best thing you can hope for is this. And things can get worse, as we will see today. And uh, so uh, definitely, if you have a category of representations of any group or supergroup, uh, it's going to have this property. And the constant Cx will be just the dimension of this vector space on which the representation is realized in the usual sense, not the super dimension, but the usual dimension. Uh, and uh, the Lin proved that the converse uh, is true as well in characteristic 0. So uh, the Lin theorem uh, is that uh, uh, so, uh, so k is going to be algebraically closed. Uh, and uh, uh, we are going to have categories over k. And the Lin's theorem says that if characteristic of k is 0, then uh, any symmetric tensor category of moderate growth uh, is super Tanakian, which means that uh, uh, it's, of the f it's uh, realized as representations of a supergroup. So I won't go into the detail here. I talked a lot about that last time, yesterday. But uh, I, today I want to talk about what happens if you drop this condition of moderate growth. So in this case, there are uh, beautiful counterexamples. So if we drop the condition of moderate growth, Uh, then uh, have counterexamples, uh, which appeared uh, already in the paper of Delin and Milne in 1981, which is called Tanakian Categories, which is the basic source on that subject. And uh, 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 the example is representations of GLT, uh, O of T, and SP of T, so classical groups, when T is an arbitrary complex number. So the examples are over C or over any field of characteristic 0. And so they are obtained by interpolating representation theory of classical algebraic groups to the case when t, the dimension of our vector space, is uh, not an integer. So since we do not have vector spaces, we might as well imagine that we do have vector spaces, but their dimension is pi. And that's what we are going to do today. So uh, how do we construct this category? 
So we want to interpolate representations of GLN. And of course, the price to pay will be, as I said, that we will lose the group itself. We will not have the group GLN. We are not going to have n-dimensional space in which it acts. And so, uh, so that's one why if you want to uh, uh, interpolate uh, this uh, representation category, we need to uh, define uh, uh, the usual representation category of GLN in such a way that we will not mention the general linear group and will not mention its uh, representation on the n-dimensional space. So let's uh, try to do that. So, uh, 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 so, uh, so construction of rep GLN uh, where n is in z plus first. So we need to have a construction that doesn't mention uh, this group and the, its uh, basic representation. Uh, so uh, we are going to use the following property. Uh, so uh, we use that every, so we know very well from classical representation theory that the category of representations of this group is semi-simple and uh, uh, every uh, representation occurs in a tensor product of uh, 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 several copies of the standard representation with several copies of the dual representation. Uh, so every uh, uh, irreducible representation uh, uh, is a direct sum. in uh, representation of the form uh, of ten in tensors of arbitrary type. So V to the R times V star to the S. And you might say, well, we don't really need V star to the S. We need just to multiply by the determinant character to an appropriate power. But the problem is that uh, uh, determinant uh, is the uh, top exterior power, the nth exterior power of uh, V. And uh, of, of course, we have exterior powers in the category, but we don't have the number n. So we're not allowed to mention n because it's going to become non-integer. So we can't really use it, and that's why we have to do this. We are not going to have, this GLT is not going to have a notion of determinant, so there won't be any difference between GLT and SLT. So uh, uh, then, uh, so let's call this uh, object RS because I, I'm not supposed to mention the V. Well, this is, of course, cheating, but soon it will become uh, more honest. Uh, OK, and so then what is the home between the representations RS and representation PQ, let's say? Well, so this is home between V to the R, V star to the S v to the p, v star to the q. And of course, you know how to compute this. You have to move all the v stars to the left. They will become v's. You have to move all the v stars from here to the right. They will become v stars. So this is going to be home from v to the r plus q, v to the s plus p. Uh, and uh, uh, this is zero unless uh, r plus q equals to s plus p, or you can write it as r minus s equals to p minus q, uh, because uh, the center of GLV acts uh, by uh, raising to this power. Uh, 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 and if they are equal, if uh, uh, we do have r minus s equals to p minus q, uh, then, uh, and let's, uh, let me say r plus q uh, equals to s plus p, and let us call this number n capital, then uh, uh, this is uh, home from v to the n to v to the n. And then we know how to compute this. This can be computed using the sure while duality. So sure while duality uh, says that this is the sure algebra. This is the definition of the sure algebra. 
so let me call it sure of uh, 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 n n. And uh, this Schur algebra, according to schur while duality, is the quotient of the group algebra. Well, let's work over complex numbers. So uh, uh, group algebra of Sn uh, and capital modulus some ideal. So uh, the theorem is that the group algebra of Sn maps surjectively onto this space. And moreover, uh, so let me call it i n n, and uh, moreover, also sure while duality uh, uh, tells us that uh, when uh, uh, the number of uh, the dimension of this space is large, namely greater or equal to little n, then uh, uh, this ideal is zero, uh, and uh, uh, home from v to the n to v to the n is isomorphic as a vector space and as an algebra to the group algebra of Sn. OK, so, uh, so in particular, uh, 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 what we see uh, uh, is that uh, uh, it's independent on the dimension of this space. And that's already very good. Because uh, we, should, we are not supposed uh, to have anything left which uh, remembers about this space. Uh, so, uh, and so let's see how the composition looks like. So suppose we have uh, 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 three uh, pairs of indices, R1, S1, R2, S2, uh, and R3, S3. Uh, uh, and suppose we want to compose uh, morphisms. So let's say take home from R1 S1 to R2 S2 and uh, home from R2 S2 to R3 S3 to uh, home from R1 S1 to R3 S3. So this is the composition. Consider composition. And so, uh, so if uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I uh, wrote inequality in the wrong order. It has to be this way. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so if this n is large, little n is large, uh, well, I mean, it's a little strange when little n is bigger than big n, but of course in the definition of limit in calculus it is also that way, so I think this is okay for me. Uh, anyway, so, so if this n is large, uh, uh, these spaces are uh, independent of n. And uh, so uh, therefore we, we can uh, ask how, uh, so we can choose some basis for example and we can ask how the matrix elements of this map depend on n. And the proposition, uh, th this map is a polynomial in n. In fact, in an appropriate basis, it will even be monomial in N, as we will see. So it's much simpler even than polynomial. And uh, this is roughly how we inter interpolate, because polynomials you can interpolate. Uh, they are determined by their values on the integers, even on large enough integers. And then we can interpolate it to arbitrary numbers. So that's the main idea. So let me explain why. So it's, pr it's a proof, if you like. Well, you can write a basis. Uh, so how do you write a basis of something like this? Uh, so the basis of home from uh, Rs to PQ is the uh, diagrams. So they're like, uh, I, would call, I will call them flat skeins. 
And uh, the way these diagrams look uh, is as follows. So uh, uh, let's say we uh, write the map from top to bottom. So let us write copies of V by arrows up. So we're going to have R arrows here. And uh, copies of V dual by arrows down. So we have S arrows here. And uh, here uh, at the bottom, we will have P arrows up and uh, uh, Q arrows down. OK? And uh, in order to have non-trivial morphisms, we need R minus S equal to P minus Q. Uh, so in this case, it's both equal to 1. And then the diagram, well, it's a permutation. So uh, basically, it's a permutation means that if you labeled the, uh, the uh, uh, up arrows uh, by 1 through n and down arrows also by 1 through n, we have to have a bijection between them. So, um, and we can draw this bijection. So for example, we can draw like this, like this, like this, and like this and like this, and like this. So that's a typical morphism in our category, and they form a basis. Uh, and now, how do we compose morphisms? Well, we just concatenate this picture. But uh, when we concatenate, what can happen is that uh, you get a loop. So you might have a picture, something like that, and it is going to hit something like this, and this will produce a loop. And whenever you have a loop, what does it mean in linear algebra situation? It just means that we are taking the trace of the identity operator on the vector space V. And uh, the answer uh, will be, of course, the dimension of the space N. But now we are not no problem to mention it because it doesn't have to be an integer. We just say that. Uh, 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 so, so the rule is the following, concatenate and replace every loop by a factor of n. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how things uh, are happen uh, uh, multiplied. And then uh, uh, let's come back to this uh, uh, construction of, of this category. Uh, well, so for example, uh, suppose uh, I have a diagram. Yeah, then I erase the loop yeah. and replace it by a factor of n. So it's the answer will be n times, suppose you have just one loop. Like, for example, so for example, if I, I, I multiply this by this, and, and this is going to be n times, times the unit. Right. And uh, or, or if you like, you, if you have, for example, a picture like this, uh, and you concatenate it this way, uh, then, then this is just going to be n times this. Uh, now let's come back to the story before. Uh, OK, of course, uh, for usual GLN, uh, so, so I mean, we can't, uh, we can't take n arbitrarily large uh, because n is fixed for us. But never mind, it's just that uh, I uh, explained that this is a property of uh, the situation when n is large. But let's come back to this, uh, to this question. How do we recover this category? So suppose we know all these morphisms and the compositions. Let's ignore the fact that uh, this, this only holds for large n. How do we recover the category? Well, I said that every object is a direct summand. And direct summand is something which is image of an idempotent, of a projector. So, and these projectors are just uh, elements of this uh, uh, endomorphism algebra. So we can get all the images of projectors by a procedure which is called Karubian completion. So this procedure actually makes sense for any additive category, which means that we first adjoin formally images of all projectors, morphisms which square to themselves. That makes sense for any category whatsoever. Doesn't even have to be linear. And then we also add arbitrary finite direct sums. And that requires linear structure, uh, but uh, uh, additive structure, but that can also be done. 
So, uh, so we, uh, we take uh, Carubian closure. of uh, the category with object. Let, let me call this uh, category C twiddle uh, with objects R and S. Is, uh, and this is going to be exactly the category of representations of GL. And note that this is a tensor category, symmetric tensor category. Namely, uh, the uh, structure of symmetric tensor category is, is obvious. We can, uh, so, uh, uh, so how do we do it on the objects Rs? Well, that's just obvious. Rs tensored with R prime S prime. Well, according to this, it has to be R plus R prime S plus S prime. And then uh, tensor product of morphisms should be just uh, putting uh, two pictures uh, to the sides of each other. And uh, so the most trivial thing you can think of in the associativity, commutativity will also be the most trivial thing you can think of. Just uh, associativity is just completely trivial. Asso commutativity will just amount on morphisms to switching their position. Uh, and uh, this recovers uh, representation category of GLN uh, uh, completely without mentioning uh, uh, V, well, with the little caveat that this works only for large n. But now we can repeat this when n is not an integer. And uh, so this means that we're interpolating from the situation when n is very large, and therefore this is going to be true, uh, uh, will, be tr will be true. So these spaces are not going to depend on n, and this is going to be polynomial in n. So uh, now define, now given a number T in C, uh, define the category uh, let me call it rep GLT with tilde rep tilde of GLT with object RS and uh, home spaces uh, with bases given by pictures with bases of flat skins and composition will be concatenation and then uh, replace loops replace each loop uh, by a factor uh, of t. Uh, so do the same thing except n is replaced by t and we don't worry about anything being large. And, and then uh, define rep glt as the Caribbean completion of rep tilde. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're, so these are flat skeins, which means that crossings, we, do, we don't distinguish between over crossings and under crossings. There is a version of this which is quantum GLN where we will distinguish. And if I have time, I'll mention that. But at the moment, we don't make any, uh, this is not uh, really. So this is just isotopic classes of these pictures. And this is completely obvious, just the matching of the beginnings and ends. OK, uh, so, uh, so we, uh, we define this category. And uh, this is exactly the Deline uh, category. Uh, except that we have a clash of notation because if t is an integer, this doesn't return the category of representations of GLN because for GLN we only have uh, this independent of n for large n and here we didn't have anything like that. So this is a larger, if t is an integer, 
positive integer, this is a larger category than representations of GLM. And so that's why uh, we, uh, so representations of this GLT when T equals N is not the usual rep GLN. Uh, so uh, th it's not the usual uh, representation category of GLN. Uh, so we are going to call the letter rep classical of GLN, just to distinguish. OK, and so, uh, so, so rep, this rep GLT is the Berlin category. And uh, you might ask whether this is a symmetric tensor category. And that would be a fair question because it's not clear. I mean, we have all the properties except that it's not clear that this category is abelian. And, uh, 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 and in fact, uh, it is not when t is an integer. Uh, so, uh, but when t is not an integer, it is abelian, which follows from the following fact. So let's consider the endomorphisms of the object R s. No. Actually, uh, it turns out that as tensor categories, uh, rep GLT and rep GL minus T are equivalent. Uh, uh, and the symmetric structures are different, but it is up to twisting symmetric structure. And, and this follows from the fact that if you take a purely odd superspace of dimension n, it is like a space of dimension minus n, and its general linear group is the same. So, uh, so it's really uh, the same story. So the endomorphisms of this Rs so this is an algebra of dimension r plus s factorial. So you might think that this is the group algebra of the symmetric group, but it is not. Because the diagrams uh, are symmetric group would be obtained if all the arrows are up. Uh, but if some arrows are up and some are down, you get a different multiplication on the same vector space. And this is called the wald brouwer algebra. W R S of T. It actually depends on this parameter T. And it's called that way because for, uh, there is a similar story, I should say, for orthogonal and symplectic groups. In that case, we don't need to take V dual because V dual is the same as V. And, uh, and then uh, endomorphisms of V to the N is uh, Schurwald duality generalizes to Brouwer duality, which uh, tells you that this is the so called Brouwer algebra also defined using diagrams. And uh, this is a walled Brouwer algebra because we have, we can draw a wall between up arrows and down arrows like here. And that would be a walled Brouwer algebra. And uh, a proposition which is non-trivial uh, is that uh, this algebra WRS of T is uh, semi-simple if uh, T is not an integer uh, with absolute value of t less than or equal uh, less strictly than the minimum of r and s. So let me give you an example how that works. Let's consider the wald brouwer algebra 1, 1. Uh, so uh, the basis is going to be well, we have just this picture uh, and also uh, this picture. And what this doesn't do anything, so this is 1. And this element I'm going to call A. And then the relation is 
that a squared means that we uh, concatenate two a's and we get one ring and an a. So, uh, so this is equal to t times a. And so the algebra, so we get uh, uh, k of a or c of a modulo a squared minus t a. And this algebra is semi-simple exactly when t is not zero, which is exactly what this inequality is saying. Any questions up to this point? OK. So uh, Um, and uh, so, so, so this is a uh, so, so this implies uh, that uh, uh, rep GLT is a semi-simple symmetric tensor category if T is not an integer, because all these endomorphisms algebra are semi-simple, and uh, we can just. Uh, consider the idempotence, primitive idempotence, images of those are going to be simple objects and so on. And uh, uh, so, uh, and, and I can, uh, 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 so we can see that this is not of moderate growth because dimension of uh, uh, the standard object V, and V now is not a vector space, but just this object one comma zero, this is equal to T. Because what is dimension? We have to take composition of evaluation and co-evaluation. So one of them is this thing, the other one is this thing, and when we compose them, we just get t. And t is not an integer, while we discuss that when we have a representation theory of a supergroup, uh, representation category of supergroup, its dimension of, will be just the super dimension of a representation. It could be negative, but it is always an integer. So the Lean theorem implies that this uh, should not have uh, 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 moderate growth. But actually, we don't need the Lean theorem to, to see this, because you can see this pretty directly, that it doesn't have moderate growth. So it's actually fun to do. Uh, you just take, uh, so if x uh, is, is in C uh, is an object of a semi-simple uh, tensor category, and uh, let's say it's a direct sum of simple objects with some multiplicities, uh, then uh, the length of x is the sum of mi, of course. And uh, the so what is endomorphism algebra of x? Well, this is just the direct sum of matrix algebras of size mi. So the dimension of this is the sum of mi squared. And so this implies that the uh, length of x squared is greater than or equal than dimension of the endomorphism algebra of x. That's for any semi-simple category. Uh, so actually, you don't need it to be tensor, just a semi-simple category. And now take x equals to v to the n in our category. Uh, then, uh, so we will get that length of x squared is greater than or equal than dimension of endomorphisms, but we know the dimension of endomorphisms is n factorial. So length of x is greater or equal than square root of n factorial, which grows faster than any exponential function. Okay, so... Uh, So now I want to characterize the simple objects in this category just to give you a feel what it looks like. So the proposition is the following. Uh, uh, simple objects in uh, rep GLT are uh, labeled by pairs of partitions. So let me call them V lambda mu, uh, where lambda and mu are arbitrary partitions.
And so let me explain why it comes out to be that way. Yes, partitions of integers, but without the uh, specification of partitions of what? Without specification of size. So there are infinitely many. But they are labeled, we are used to uh, labeling representations of GLN by a single partition. But actually, in this case, we will have pairs of partitions. So this should remind you, those who studied supergroups, uh, this should remind you them, because for them, we get pairs of partition, one for odd and one for even. And uh, that's uh, not a coincidence, as you will see in a few minutes. So, uh, so pairs of partitions. And uh, so what does this interpolate? So this V, uh, uh, so, so maybe what do I mean by interpolating? Uh, so we have a, a, when T is an integer, so if T is in Z plus, we have a monoidal functor. Uh, from rep GLT to rep classical of GLT. Uh, and uh, uh, it's actually full. So it's a tensor functor, symmetric monoidal functor, uh, 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 except that uh, this is not a tensor functor between a uh, symmetric tensor category in my sense of yesterday's lecture, because this category isn't abelian, as I said, for integer t. And uh, so the, uh, well, let's call this n just not to uh, have unpleasant feeling that I'm denoting integer by t. Uh, but in any case, uh, so we have this functor. And uh, what we'll, it will we'll do is, where does it send this v lambda mu? Well, it sends it to the following representation. Uh, so uh, highest weight is going to be the following. Lambda 1, lambda s. Uh, 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 lambda 1, lambda r. Then a bunch of zeros. And then minus mu s, minus mu 1. So this is decreasing. Uh, and uh, uh, how many uh, terms altogether? Well, it has to be m. So you might ask me what happens if this can only, this only makes sense if n is greater or equal than r plus s. So what happens if n is less than r plus s? So then uh, the answer is very simple. This goes to 0. So these objects are interpolations of such things when, uh, when n becomes very large. So we have two partitions, one at the beginning, one at the end. And then you put many, many zeros in between and uh, interpolate with respect to n. And um, uh, how to characterize this representation? So, so this I will also call v lambda mu for GLN, for your classical v lambda mu. And so how do you characterize it? Well, you should take, so you know that it, for every partition, you have sure functor attached to this partition, which is a polynomial functor in the category of vector spaces. So I'm supposed to take s lambda of v and tensor it with s mu of v dual. And then this v lambda mu is a summand in there. Uh, but it doesn't occur in any smaller one. So if you have lambda prime and mu prime, uh, then it doesn't occur if lambda prime has smaller size than lambda where mu prime has a low, smaller size than mu. Uh, and uh, there is a similar story uh, for uh, uh, orthogonal groups and symplectic groups. Uh, it actually, uh, it turns out to be the same story, because uh, uh, orthogonal group for t is the same as symplectic group for minus t. Uh, up to twist of symmetric structure. And uh, this reflects uh, people who do uh, representation theory uh, of classical groups uh, know that uh, if you do representation theory of symplectic group, for example, sometimes by replacing n by minus n, you get the corresponding objects for orthogonal group. For example, if you take the dimension of symplectic group, 
and uh, set n to be minus n, you get the corresponding dimension of the orthogonal group. And uh, that's a manifestation of this, uh, this symmetry here. And there is an even more interesting story about symmetric groups, which is uh, actually rather different, but st still very analogous to this story. And uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to explain. So also we have, this is later done also by Delin. And this is semi-simple if t is not a positive integer. No, I, I didn't define it. I, I won't have time, unfortunately. But it's a very interesting story, but I won't have time. But it's an interpolation of representation theory of symmetric group. Uh, yeah, so, so you might ask, uh, so why is it that for, we have orthogonal groups for all t, but you have symplectic groups only for even t? So what plays the role of symplectic groups for odd t? Well, the answer actually is there, there is a supergroup, OSP 2n1, whose uh, standard representation has dimension 2n minus 1. And uh, this uh, supergroup has the property that this is the only uh, simple supergroup, which is not a group, and uh, which is reductive. Its representations are semi-simple. And that plays the role of symplectic group uh, with odd t. In other words, uh, the corresponding Delin category maps surjectively onto the representation category of that supergroup. So that's explained in the paper of Delin. So other questions? Uh, no, no, the metaplectic group is not algebraic. Uh, so it's not, uh, yeah, it doesn't, fa doesn't fit into this theory, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Well, but it's not, not the, the, here it's not. Here the role is played by the supergroup. Uh, yeah, okay, and so uh, 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 then uh, I want to uh, quote a theorem by Combs and Wilson, uh, which, uh, which tells us what are the tensor ideals in this category. Because in particular, when we take th this map, it uh, quotients out the tensor ideal of negligible morphisms, where they are negligible in the sense that I explained yesterday. But, but there are also other smaller, this is the biggest tensor ideal, such that the quotient becomes a semi-simple category. But there are, there are actually other ideals. So uh, the tensor ideals in uh, rep GLT, when t is in uh, z plus, so let me use z plus because I said t and minus t are really the same, are i0 containing i1 I2, and so on. Uh, so uh, so non-zero ideals look like this. And this is the biggest ideal, the maximal ideal, which is the negligible morphisms. And then the others are smaller. And then if you take the quotient, rep GLT modula I M, this embeds Interrepresentations of GL supergroup T plus M M. So uh, and actually the, it is not surjective anymore. You don't get all the objects. So it's a full functor, but it's not uh, uh, essentially surjective anymore. You only get some subcategory, but it's a very fairly big one. And so. Uh, um, and also there is a theorem about universal property. So the theorem is that uh, rep GLT has a universal property, namely uh, tensor functors uh, symmetric tensor functors from rep GLT to any uh, tensor category D. It doesn't have to be abelian is the same thing 
as object x in D such that dimension of x equals to t. That's all. So to specify a tensor functor from this category to any d, you just need to specify an object with this property. And uh, then you just uh, define the functor by sending v to that object. And everything else goes along for the right. And uh, by the way, this category doesn't even have to be rigid. If it's not rigid, then I should say dualizable object. Uh, which means an object that has a dual. So that's a very nice and a very important category which represents uh, this functor uh, the, 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 of the, such objects. So. Questions? All right. So if there is no questions, I want to talk about what happens uh, uh, when uh, 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 for for integer uh, for non-integer t, so this category isn't abelian. The question is, can we define an abelian tensor category? Uh, so the question uh, can we embed? Uh, rep GLT when T is an integer into uh, an abelian symmetric tensor category. So the one in the sense of what I talked about yesterday. Right. Yeah, 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 T and K. So K characteristic zero, it will be T and K. But when K is characteristic P, it will be another story. So I'm going to say what, that, what happened. Right. So, so far, it's going to be characteristic zero. And if I have time, I will say something about positive. Right. Right. So, and the answer is yes. And uh, so this is the theorem of uh, n to the Eisenbahn. Hinich uh, 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 and Serganova. No, no, when t is not in z, this is a semi-simple category. So there is not, it's already abelian. There is no need to do anything. But when, uh, when it is, uh, th this category is not abelian. We don't have kernels and co-kernels. But the theorem is you can embed it, uh, and uh, moreover, in a universal way. So there exists a, a unique uh, uh, symmetric tensor category, which is called rep GLT abelian, uh, such that with, with the inclusion, rep GLT, just a full, uh, full subcategory, full tensor subcategory in rep GLT abelian, so this just has more objects, uh, such that whenever you have a monoidal functor from here to, uh, to a category D, which doesn't kill any of the ideals, which is injective on morphisms, then it factors, so and this is a billion symmetric tensor category, then it factors through here in a unique way. So such functors can be also characterized such that uh, uh, any f from rep GLT, so, so for any object such that uh, uh, symmetric tensor functors, tensor functors from uh, rep abelian GLT to D uh, corresponds to objects x in D uh, uh, such that uh, dualizable dimension t such that sure functor of it is not zero for any partition lambda. So, uh, so this, for example, for example, this functor doesn't factor through this abelian envelope. So this is called the abelian envelope. A and uh, uh, this functor doesn't factor through the abelian envelope 
because it kills an ideal. In other words, because if you take any ve super vector space of finite dimension, there is always a sure functor that kills it. In fact, there is a nice description of such functors. So if you have a super space CMN, then uh, what you're supposed to do is uh, you're supposed to draw a, a quarter plane and uh, M uh, N. A and uh, uh, if your partition, uh, Young diagram, doesn't fit into this uh, uh, strip here, then the corresponding sure functor of this space is 0 and vice versa. So for example, for this partition. OK, so, uh, so that's the universal property. And now I want to, and, and there are similar stories for ST, OT, and SPT, which I won't have time to explain. But let me construct this category. Actually, so this was conjectured by Deligne, that there is this uh, abelian envelope. And actually, it's not a problem to construct an abelian envelope. The problem is to show that your construction has a universal property. Because otherwise, you are going to have many different constructions. And you will never be able to prove that they are the same. But if you have one which has universal property, you can show that it maps to all the others. And they, that by that, you show that they are the same. So I'm going, going to give you another construction, which is due to the line of this abelian envelope, and which is based on uh, ultra filters. Uh, yeah, uh, there is also a similar theorem for ST, uh, which is due to uh, the Lean and Ostrich. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, explain another construction due to the Lean of this abelian envelope. And actually, it will work for all t, including non integer. For non integer t, uh, uh, this is just the same as rep ST. Uh, GLT, I'm doing GLT when t is not in z. So let me, uh, let me give you the Lin's ultra filter construction. And for this purpose, let me remind you what ultra filters are. So I was always scared of them when I uh, uh, studied uh, general topology, but, uh, but then it turns out to be very useful. So abstractly, you can say that if you have any set S, then uh, an uh, ultra filter on S is a character uh, of the algebra of functions with values in field of two elements into this field. Uh, because, so, but, uh, but what it really is, uh, it's the set, so the another definition, it is a subset of uh, the set of subsets of S with some properties. So these are called the uh, almost everything subset. So normally almost everything means all but finitely many, but here there will be a different notion. So these are subsets which we are going to call almost everything. And these are exactly the subsets. So uh, subset X is an F if, uh, uh, so, so let me call it uh, chi F. Uh, if chi, chi F of uh, uh, the indicator function of X is 1. And if chi F of indicator function of X is 0, then uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is almost nothing. Uh, so, uh, and any function in here is indicator function of some set. So uh, this will uh, completely describe it. And the conditions are very simple. So first of all, uh, the whole set S is an F. So e everything is almost everything. Then the second uh, axiom is that if you have uh, a subset X in Y and X is almost everything, then also y is almost everything. So if you enlarge an almost everything subset, it's almost everything. The third property is that uh, exactly one, well, may maybe the third property is uh, if x and y are almost everything, then their intersection, they are so big that their intersection is also almost everything. And the fourth property is exactly one of x and x complement is in, is in f. 
And these properties, it's easy to show, it's an easy exercise, that it's equivalent to having a character like this. And then, uh, uh, well, uh, what kind of ultra filters exist? So there is a very simple example, uh, uh, which is called principal ultra filter. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, well, of course, what can be the characters of this? So the elements of S, evaluations at points of S, gives you such a character. So if you have some x in S, you have fx, uh, which is principal ultra filter, uh, which is the set of all subsets x in uh, S, which contain this element. I call this narcissistic ultra filter, because the set, it's like the set of people is almost everything if it contains me, and almost nothing if it doesn't contain me. For example, this audience here, the set of people who are in this room, is almost everything, but everybody, those who are outside this room is almost nothing. <laughs> uh, but uh, and on finite sets, you can show that that's the only ultra filters that exist. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, but on an infinite set, axiom of choice implies uh, that there exist others. And uh, you cannot show this, so this is not uh, constructive. So you cannot construct such a thing, but can only deduce from axiom of choice that it exists. So axiom of choice implies there exists non-principal ultra filters. And um, if you have such an ultra filter, so I will only consider non-principal from now on. And so suppose you have an ultra filter f on the uh, uh, natural numbers. So in this case, you can, uh, there is important construction, which is called ultra product. Uh, and uh, this ultra product uh, is uh, the following thing. So, uh, so there's a product, let's say, of sets Si uh, for i in uh, n or n in n. Uh, along f. And uh, what is this? Uh, this is the set of sequences uh, x1, which is in S1, x2, which is in S2, and so on. Uh, uh, but actually, I'm lying slightly. Uh, this should be defined for almost all with respect to f i in, uh, in n. Uh, so, so some of these xi's may not even be defined. Only most of them, almost all, all, for almost all, they have to be defined. And also a sequence xi is proclaimed to be the same as xi prime if xi is equal to xi prime almost everywhere. So for almost all uh, elements with respect to this ultra filter. So, and then uh, you can show that uh, if this set has, uh, these sets have some structure, then uh, the, this product is going to be also, has, have some s such structure. Um, uh, so for example, uh, uh, it could be group, uh, ring, field, and so on. And all properties go along for the ride, except for various finiteness properties. So you can get something infinite in the limit. So for example, let us do an exercise. What is the ultra product over n and n? Uh, with respect to f of q bar. So we have q bar everywhere. So what is this? So this is going to be a field, because all of them are fields. This is going to be uh, characteristic 0, because all of them are of characteristic 0. And this is going to be uh, a cardinality continuum. And then there is a famous theorem that this is isomorphic to complex numbers. Now, what uh, is, uh, let's try to identify some elements in there. So let's take this sequence, one, two, three, four, and so on. And so this is going to be in this uh, uh, ultra product. So what kind of element is this remarkable sequence? Well, let's see. So this, uh, 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 this is a transcendental number. Because if uh, it satisfied some equation, that would require that almost all terms in this sequence satisfy the same equation. 
But of course, that's not true. Now, let's call it t. Now, the question, which transcendental number? Is it pi or e or uh, maybe something else? Uh, well, the answer is it's whatever you want. Because when I said that it's isomorphic to c, it's isomorphic in many different ways. And there is no preferred way. And of course, there are automorphisms of c that may map any transcendental number to any others. So, so whatever you, whichever you want. So we can choose this isomorphism uh, in such a way that it will be whatever number you want. And now we can take the following construction. We can also take products not just of sets or rings or fields, but also of categories. So we can take the product of uh, over n in uh, n with respect to this ultra filter of the usual representation categories of GLNC. Well, actually, let's do Q bar just to fit our example. Well, this will be a symmetric tensor category over C, except uh, uh, that it won't be symmetric tensor category in my sense. Because there was, remember, there, so you, you can only use statements from first order logic. So remember, we had one axiom that involved the condition that objects have finite length. Ha! Ah, this word is forbidden. Uh, you can have uh, lengths one in the first place, two in the second place, three in the third place, and so on. So you can get, uh, so that axiom is going to be violated. And so this looks like it's a bad idea, the whole thing, because we want to get a t category of finite length, but we're getting something horrible. But there is an easy fix. We t there is an object v here, which is c, c squared, c cubed, and so on. And uh, so th this is a certain object. And then we can take the category generated by this object. So we can take tensor powers of this object and those dual tensor products and projectors and do the same thing. So it generates a tensor category. And the theorem is that C is isomorphic to rep GLT. Uh, so this is for transcendental T. Right. But, but of course, this doesn't solve the problem for algebraic T and uh, all, uh, all the more for integer T. So, uh, uh, but I ran out of time. <laughs> but uh, I said that the lecture uh, tomorrow will be about characteristic P. And that's good because actually, uh, in order to obtain algebraic t and integer t, you need to do uh, ultra product with respect to primes of objects defined in characteristic p. But that will be the subject of the next lecture.